Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Thursday edition of the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. Dan Lobby with Mary Kay Cabot and Ashley Bastock, and we are going to talk coordinators today. Of course, the Browns uh, made the hire of Bubba Van Trone official. Mary Kay, just let's start here. What do you remember about old Bubba when he was running down the field playing special teams for, for the Browns? And did you think, now I don't know how much you guys talked to him back then, but did you think this guy was like, not just coordinator, but maybe future head coach then at the time? Was that even a something to consider? No, I don't think you really look at, you know, a, a special teams ace and think, hmm, head coach material. I mean, usually, <laughs> uh, you know, that thought doesn't really cross your mind. But I will say uh, that what I remember about Bubba back then is, I mean, he was one of Eric Mangini's green sticker guys. And back then, green sticker meant something different than it does now. Uh, now we talk about it in terms of the, uh, you know, the dot on the helmet that means you're calling plays for the defense. But uh, back then when Eric Mangini talked about his green sticker guys, and the Browns have a different name for theirs, um, but it's it's guys that just have almost flawless character. I mean, they are just like such amazing guys that, uh, you know, you just pop that green sticker up there on the draft board and uh, and you know that you're not going to have anything to worry about. He was a really good leader. He was one of our, you know, one of our go-to guys, one of the guys that you talk to uh, a lot at his locker and after games to help, help explain things and illuminate things. And, you know, you just knew that he was uh, a really, really good guy and that he would be successful in whatever he does. And he was personable and affable and all those things. So I think he's going to bring an energy. I think he's going to bring some passion. I think he's going to bring, I think that's what you need at on special teams. You need somebody to get everybody fired up. And I think he's going to help do that. Uh, I think even if you just look at some of his pictures from back when he was with the Browns, you know, you just see the facial expressions, you see the energy. And I think that's what he brings. I am a little disappointed that the hair is gone. Like it's just those pictures have the hair flying everywhere and and it's great. Um, Ashley, I, I mean, look, the, the special teams coordinator a lot of times is the loudest guy on the practice field and, and Ray Ventrone is certainly going to uh, be that I would imagine for this team. But um, I mean, this does sort of feel like a new special teams era for the Browns. And maybe that was just because Mike Prefer was here for so long. He spanned two head coaches. Um, but this just feels like, okay, this was the guy they really wanted and they went and got him. Yeah. And I mean, like Mary Kay has written since this hire, you know, in the annual special teams rankings from uh, Rick Gosling, the longtime NFL writer, like they, his teams have been in the top five, I think four, four times out of his five years as special teams coordinator with the Colts. So I think this is a guy who you look at, everything we know about him and his personality and how fiery he can be and motivated he can be. And it might just be like kind of the breath of fresh air that the Browns need when you consider what some of their problems have been in recent years, right? Like the kick return game has been horrible. Like they've done dumb things like not having the right number of people on the field, um, not being able to recover onside kicks was a problem this year. So I think just a guy with a new perspective who kind of can be that motivator who can help Cade York develop further and maybe get past some of those mental blocks that he dealt with as a young kicker. Like, I think all those things are huge and point to this unit going in a different direction that it's been in under Mike Pree for the last four years. Now, Mary Kay, one of the things we know about Bubba and, you know, you tweeted this, you've written it. He wants to be a head coach. I actually almost wonder, and I don't know if he'll answer this when we do finally get a chance to talk to him. I almost wonder if one of the reasons he's here is because if this is like a domino effect of the Jeff Saturday hire, right? Like, cause he was a guy that maybe could have been the interim there, but he's one of the guys that got passed over and probably created some hard feelings for a few guys in that building. Um, but if, if that's the case, that's the Browns fortune. What is it about Ventrone that you think, you know, how important is it? I guess let's ask it this way. How important is it for Kevin to have another guy in that building and we'll, we'll talk about Jim Schwartz a little bit too. Another guy in that building who he hasn't been a head coach, but he's got those traits and he aspires to be a head coach. Well, you know, I think first of all, um, it should be noted. And, you know, we, we had this at cleveland.com today before anybody else that he uh, has also been given the title of assistant head coach. And I think that's pretty significant. Now, more so than anything, it was a way to get him here, right? Because if they did not give him that, 
then chances are the Colts would have been able to either keep him or keep him from interviewing here in the first place. So he does have that title of assistant head coach. And I do think it's good to have people like that on the staff. I think it's good to have diversity of thought and of everything else on a staff anyways. Um, but I do think it is good to have somebody that that thinks like that and that is going to be, I think, taking his role as assistant head coach a little bit more seriously than maybe even the Browns intend it right now. I think he's going to be thinking like, what would I do in this situation? Or how might I handle this? Or maybe even offering suggestions to Kevin Stefanski on things that he sees or would do differently. So I think it's, I think it's good. I think you've got somebody on the staff that's really hungry and really wants to improve his lot. And so they've got a mix. They've got guys that are sort of, you know, winding it down and on the back nine of their career, more so like a Jim Schwartz, maybe more so like even Bill Callahan, perhaps. And then now you've got some young, energetic guys that bring different perspectives. So I think it's very helpful. Yeah, Ashley, how important do you think those traits are uh, to this, just the makeup of this staff in general? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important given, again, kind of like the problems we've seen with them recently. And sometimes it just felt with some of these mistakes, you know, once again, I'm going to bring up not having the right number of people on the field, which was a problem the last two years. Um, I just think it's going to be helpful to have more people focusing or at least contemplating on that big picture. Um, Because obviously we know Kevin's calling plays and, and there's only so much he can do in that given moment. But even with this title and, you know, how these titles work sometimes, um, I think it, it doesn't hurt to have another guy who, as we know, wants to be a head coach in the future, kind of thinking along those lines. And I think it, it's just good for not only the players to have a different voice, but for Kevin Stefanski to have a different voice and a different perspective compared to the last few years. So, Mary Kay, one of the big tasks here for um, for Ventrone is going to be this kicker that the Browns have invested a lot of, I mean, a fourth round pick for a kicker is a huge investment and you know, they need him to be successful and they can't, they cannot lose games because of Cade York this year. How does, you know, when we talk about him, obviously we talk about the coverage units, we talk about all, you know, all of those things, but really a lot of this is about Cade York. How, how do you think he helps in that regard? Well, I think the first thing that we should try to find out is how did he take Chase McLaughlin from making only four of 10 kicks from 40 to 49 yards last year in Cleveland? And then under Bubba Ventrone this past year, he made nine of 11 from that distance. Okay. So obviously indoors, different situation that has a lot to do with everything, but I think it's probably more than that. Bubba maybe identified something that was going wrong. I I don't know what happened, but that's pretty damn significant to go from 4 of 10 to 9 of 11 from that distance. And that's the reason why, obviously, Chase McLaughlin is not in Cleveland anymore and Cade York is here because of that particular chunk of field goals, that 4 of 10, because he could make them from 50-plus. He was making them from 50 plus like crazy. Couldn't make 40 to 49 and he was gone. Then he goes over there and somehow they figured it out. I don't know how they did it, but I think it's a good sign for Cade York because Cade York's issue last year, as we all know, in addition to having three kicks blocked and they're going to have to figure that out. um, But in addition to that, he struggled at home, making only 10 of 16 field goals at First Energy Stadium. I think Bubba is going to dig into that and fix it. And he has to. He's got to figure that out. But he knows what it's like to play at First Energy Stadium. He knows what those wins are like. He played there for four years. So he knows all about that. I mean, you know, I'm sure he will have ideas and things that he can do uh, to get Cade York up to where he needs to be. Because like you mentioned, that is vitally important for the special teams. They've got to fix that. They've got to get him up and running again and, you know, on a trajectory actually towards a Pro Bowl. I mean, when you draft a kicker that high, you expect that he's going to be in a Pro Bowl over the next three or four years. So 
that's really the goal. And, and I think that, uh, I think Bubba's going to be really good for him. You know, Mary Kay, as you were talking, I started to think about this. You know who Bubba Ventrone was teammates with and who he probably has a really strong relationship with and probably could say, hey, buddy, why don't you give my kicker a call and talk to him? And hey, kicker, why don't you listen to this guy? Because I played with him and he was really good. Does this open up maybe some more lines of communication to Phil Dawson? I think so. I really do think so. Um, and I think it should. You know, I think there there might be a, a reach back to a little bit of Josh Cribbs for something. There might be a little bit of a reach back to Phil Dawson for something, right? Uh, so, yeah, I definitely think that, um, you know, that there will be some of that from, from Bubba Ventron. And I think there should be. Now, for whatever reason, uh, Cade York seemed somewhat reluctant in the past. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but I mean, he didn't seem to be like overly eager to reach out to Phil. I think he got sick and tired of us asking about it. (laughs) Like, I think if he was going to hear one more Phil Dawson question from us, his brain was going to just explode. Um, But, you know, there's a whole lot to be learned from a guy like that. Um, You know, playing the angles, playing the wind down at First Energy Stadium. And I do think that um, it would be a really smart thing to do. And, and Ashley, you're our Cade York whisperer. Um, yes. Obviously, look, we haven't talked to Bubby yet. We don't. We haven't had a chance to. Re- Mary Kay has met him. Uh, you and I have not. Uh, but I mean, how do you think this impacts Cade? I mean, I think for me, kind of going back to that, the Phil Dawson thing is interesting. Number one, right? Because that is, in theory, like we're talking about, another avenue for that connection to grow. And I mean, I know Cade had talked to him like once or twice, it sounded like. And like Mary Kay said, I think he just was hesitant to be compared to Phil too early on and and wants to be his own person, which I get. But I think you don't want to be so independent to the point that you're not getting, you know, all the help from this very successful person who had to kick in this very difficult place that you can. So I am curious if that's part of it. But I think, too, with Cade, and he's admitted this, the biggest blocks for him were mental. And it was focusing too much on technique. Now, Mike Prefer talked about that, I think, like midway through the season about he's such a perfectionist. You don't want him so focused on that all the time. I think that was a lesson that was kind of hard for Cade to learn. and It was part of his adjustment. But it seemed like over the last three games, you know, he didn't miss a kick. He talked to me like before those games and said he kind of had identified the problem. And I think he took some steps to fixing it. Um, Now, I think it's a matter of can he fix it in bigger games and, like Mary Kay said, make those kicks more consistently at home. Because some of those misses he had were so bad. You know, I think of, like, the one against the Bucks where it was so wide left. It missed the net behind the goalpost. Those kind of misses aren't anything with his technique. Like, he works too hard on it. It's mental at that point. So I think having a new coordinator – in Bubba Ventron, a guy who was so well respected on special teams, who's been there, who's a bit more of a fiery personality, like all of those things, I think can help him maybe get out a little bit of that perfectionist headspace. Just listening to a guy who who's kind of you know not at that position, but been there, done that for for the Browns too in this stadium, like Mary Kay said. Okay, let's take a break, and then I want to talk about just the makeup of the staff as a whole and, and sort of how. You know what Kevin Stefanski now has to work with as he goes into his fourth season. And welcome back to the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. Dan Lobby, Mary Kay Cabot, Ashley Bastock. Okay, a little spoiler here. Uh, we're going to have a pod coming out where we're talking about all the different coaches uh, in Cleveland. And Mary Kay, I just sat and listened to uh, the segment you recorded with Doug and Ashley. And... I think it's really interesting how this staff has been remade and you were, you were kind of pointing out that Kevin has, he's remade this staff to have a guy like Ventrone, like we talked about, who wants to be head coach, but really now you've got a guy like Jim Schwartz who has been a head coach, who's been a Super Bowl winning defensive coordinator, adding that level of experience, you know, to Alex Van Pelt and Bill Callahan And, you know, I would actually throw Chad O'Shea in there because he was a guy who was in New England for a long time, and he's been a coordinator at the NFL level. Adding that that experience of Jim Schwartz, it just feels like Kevin is doing something very specific 
with this coaching staff. Are, are you seeing that? And, and what do you think it is he's trying to build with this staff? Well, I think specifically uh, what he did with the two coordinator positions that he filled is he upgraded them with coordinators that are two of the best traditionally at their positions in the NFL. I mean, Jim Schwartz has an unbelievable track record. And when I talk to Eagles players about him during Super Bowl week, uh, those guys raved about him. They loved playing for him. Of course, they won a Super Bowl with him. Some of them did in Philadelphia. That helps. Um, but, you know, you've got that. You've got a Super Bowl ring from Jim Schwartz. You've got a Super Bowl ring from um, from Bubba Ventrone when he was assistant special teams coach uh, with the Patriots. So I think what you're seeing, the common denominator there is not only experience, but high level success, a high, high level of success. You're talking about really high rankings in terms of sacks and, and, and different things like that on defense. And then special teams wise, uh, as, as we have mentioned, um, Bubba Ventrone's uh, special teams units ranked he out of his five years as a coordinator in Indy four times, they were in the top 10. I mean, that's remarkable. Twice they were in the top five. That that's incredible. That's, that's hard to do. And, um, you know, it takes commitment. You've got to commit the resources to it. You've got to commit the players to it, but I don't think you're going to go out and get a coach like this and then not give him the players. But again, I think what Kevin Stefanski is doing here is putting really successful, experienced, high level coaches in place and letting those sides of the ball take care of themselves. So he can focus on what he needs to do better this year and that is figure out how to make sure that Deshaun Watson and this offense are as explosive and powerful as they can possibly be. It feels to me like he's stepping out of his comfort zone a little bit too. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I want to hear both of your thoughts on this because with Joe Woods, right, that was a guy he knew in Minnesota. Uh, Mike Prefer, a guy he knew in Minnesota who was already here um, for a year mm -hmm. under Freddie Kitchens and he was already in the building. There was a lot of familiarity with the staff that he brought with him, which I understand. That's kind of what you want to do. You know, you want to, you have to have people you can trust. Ashley, when I was sitting in that Jim Schwartz presser, I thought one of the interesting things was, you know, he, he raved about Andrew Barry and he knows Andrew from that year. They worked together in Philly, but he kind of said he didn't really know Kevin that well. So I, I think it's, I think in some ways, and I, I don't know if there's a tie between Bubba Ventrone and Kevin Stefanski that I'm missing, but in some ways, it feels like he's stepping out of his comfort zone a little bit here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think at times over the last like two years, especially when, you know, fans have been frustrated by the defense's performance and frustrated at Joe Woods and frustrated by Mike Prefer um, and the special teams and the lack of production there. Like it just always kind of felt like, well, the assumption is they're they're going to be safe because like Kevin's comfortable with them. He knows them from going back to Minnesota. So I definitely agree that this is a step, you know, away from that first staff that he brought along with him in his first time as head coach and some of these guys that he had known for years. So, I mean, essentially given where the Browns are now, and I think the expectations they have, like it says a lot, I think that he's willing to do that because they need to, you know, get something going here within the next few years. I mean, I think we all know how important this window becomes with Deshaun Watson's contract and some of these other guys being in their prime. So I do think it's interesting that, you know, they're willing to take this risk now. And I think like, it just shows like how, you know, things hadn't gone a certain way to this point that made him and this organization feel like they had to go in a different direction at those spots, because I do think it was necessary. Am, am I making too much of that, Mary Kay? Or it, is there something there to the fact that these are these are guys that maybe and I know there's like there's other guys on the staff that didn't necessarily have ties to Kevin before this, but these are two really prom. I mean, these are two of your three coordinators. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there were that they had very specific needs in these areas. Um, let's take the defense for instance. The defense needed discipline. They needed discipline. And Jim Schwartz is a very strict, hard-nosed disciplinarian. He is not going to put up with, he wouldn't put up with a player refusing to play on first and second down the way that Jadavian Clowney did in that game. You, you're not going to pull that off with Jim Schwartz 
and, you know, go on your merry way after that. That that wouldn't happen. I mean, that just, it's not going to happen. Uh, so I think Kevin St- Stefanski identified that uh, this was a young defense. In many cases, there are a lot of young guys. Um, they needed a firmer hand. I think that I think that's one of the things that they were really probably looking for there. You know, you've got the Perry on Winfrey's that, you know, that he needs to kind of come up the learning curve a little bit. Uh, they, you know, they were kind of, you know, the the inmates seem to be running the asylum at times. And I think that Kevin Stefanski wanted to put an end to that and have someone kind of bring the hammer down. And I think Jim Schwartz, from everything I can tell, he's learned to find to strike that balance between patting somebody on the back and booting them in the behind. You know, I, I think he's got that. So I really think that, um, you know, that Kevin sort of deferred to Andrew Barry because Andrew knows Jim Schwartz and Kevin really doesn't. So, yeah, you're right. I do think there's some outside of the comfort zone vibe going there. Um, but as far as with Bubba, I think he has a super comfort level and comfort zone with, with Bubba. I think he really, uh, you know, this is the guy he wants and does feel comfortable with. So if anything, maybe he didn't feel as comfortable with Mike Prefer, but kind of went with the tried and true. Somebody had worked with for a long time, maybe even felt, you know, I've got to give this guy a chance. I worked with him for all these years in Minnesota. He's already here. Let's, let's go. And then once you're, once you're into it, it's hard, you know, it's hard to make a change. It's hard to fire somebody, especially somebody from Cleveland. Again, somebody that you've known for a long time, but it seems to me like Bubba is a fit. You know, when I, when I go around and I meet some of Kevin Stefanski's friends in the NFL, like Jonathan Gannon, like Scott Turner, you know, I mean, they more so have a Bubba feel to them. You know, they're around the same age. Bubba is 40, you know, Kevin's 40, you know, they're like, they're in that same age range. Um, they kind of think the same way about things, about the game, uh, about the, about their experiences. So I actually think in that case, um, that he does have a comfort level with, with Bubba and that is in his comfort zone. Okay, one last thing. Um, I promise I'm not going to make a Baker Mayfield comparison here, so don't read too much into this. But, Ashley, there is a feeling here. And again, going back to that that segment that Mary Kay did for the podcast that we're going to do on the coaches that, that people are getting to hear, I just, as I listened to that, it feels, it almost felt like building everything up around a quarterback, right? You got your quarterback. Now you got to get your offensive line. You got to get your receivers. You got to get, right. You have to build things up around him. Hearing Mary Kay talk about this staff makes me feel a little bit like this is Kevin sort of, okay, I'm here. I've kind of identified where I need to, you know, where I might have some weaknesses, maybe what I need to do better, what I need to focus on. And now I'm going to build everything up around me and make sure that everything else around me sort of complements what I do, fills in any gaps that maybe need filled. Um, I, I mean, I because of that, I feel pretty good about where this staff is at. I've already made the promise that I'm not going to let the Browns trick me into winning this offseason yes. again. But I do <laughs> feel good about sort of where this staff is at right now. Yeah, I think when you look at them on paper again, because we're not going to get too far too far ahead of ourselves here, they do plug some holes that this team needed. And from, you know, we don't know exactly what Jim Schwartz's scheme is going to look like with this group and what kind of reinforcements they're going to bring in on defense. But there's no denying at the very least that there was a problem on defense with starting slow in each of the last two years. And I think the Browns and Kevin Stefanski knew they couldn't afford to do that again and take the chance that that was going to happen again, um, especially when the problems weren't like, outwardly evident of why it kept happening. So I think too, the other part of the Jim Schwartz hire and, you know, when they didn't exactly part ways with some of these assistants, but like Mary Kay has said, like made it clear to guys like Chris Kiffin and Jeff Howard that they were free to pursue other opportunities because Jim Schwartz, we assume is going to want to bring in some guys that he has some familiarity with, or that he thinks, you know, can coach the defensive line the way he wants it coached since it is such an important part of his scheme and can really beef up that part of the defense. 
Um, and then special teams, kind of like the same thing, right? It's been this problem that was nagging. And because Kevin Stefanski is such an offensive-minded coach and calls the plays, he can't be sitting there in a game kind of and being that CEO overseeing every little thing. So like we've talked about, when you bring in a guy like a Jim Schwartz, like a Bubba Ventrone, you're kind of like handing over the keys a little bit, or at least loaning the keys out for those phases of the game. And I think that is him kind of recognizing, like you're saying, Dan, building up the parts of this team where there were like definitive weaknesses that just about everyone looked at and said, this needs to get better if this team is going to make a serious postseason push. Yeah. And like Mary Kay, I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think it's bad if Kevin looks at a situation and says, you know, the Jadavion situation, right? Like, Hey, my defensive coordinator needs to handle that. That's maybe that's not what I do best. So my D coordinator needs to handle that. So I'm going to bring in a guy that I know can handle that stuff. Like you've been saying, it's sort of, you know, identifying weaknesses and finding the guys that can fill that gap and do the things that maybe Kevin doesn't excel at or just doesn't want to have to deal with on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. And again, like with, with Baba, I mean, it gives him an opportunity uh, to have somebody on the, uh, you know, on the staff that has that super fiery personality. And, you know, he's that sideline guy that, you know, can, can fire everybody up. And that's, and we, you know, pe- Kevin gets criticized a lot for not being that. Well, maybe he doesn't have to be that, but maybe some other guys can be that. So I think there's that. And then also in terms of staff building, I just wanted to note that um, there is a chance that he might go back to the 2020 and 2021 model of not having a designated quarterbacks coach. That's what I have heard might happen. Don't know for sure yet. But that's one option that he might go ahead and not have that quarterbacks coach there, thereby Alex uh, Van Pelt would probably have, you know, more one on one interaction with Deshaun and kind of serve as the quarterbacks coach in addition to offensive coordinator. And of course, we know he doesn't call the plays. So he, you know, might have that time to devote. So, you know, I thought that was kind of an interesting thing to note as well. Okay, there we go. Uh, Bubba Ventrone on board now as a special teams coordinator as this staff uh, continues to take shape and sort of reach its final form for the 2023 season. Of course, we'll cover it all. Make sure you're a Football Insider subscriber, cleveland.com slash Browns, the blue banner at the top of the page. Uh, And also get subscribed to this podcast, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We will be giving you daily pods at the Combine, which we are headed to next week. So you'll want to be a Football Insider subscriber. You'll want to be subscribed to this podcast. And you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Cleveland Browns on cleveland.com. If you search that, you'll find it. Uh, For Mary Kay and Ashley, I'm Dan. Thanks for listening, everybody.